get started. <laughs> so thanks for joining. Uh, like I said, if you don't already have a free account, I would recommend you just set one up. Um, sorry, as people are joining, I'm un I'm allowing them to unmute themselves. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you don't already have an account, I would recommend you do so. You just go to bdresearchcloud.com. If you have a Flojo portal account, it's the same email and password. If you don't have one, not a problem, just hit create account and follow the uh, instructions there. Okay, I will get started. So for today, I'm just gonna do a, a brief overview of BDRC and its ca uh, capabilities, but then I'll focus on what's new for uh, V5.1 that came out um, recently. So if you're not familiar, Research Cloud is an online ecosystem uh, supporting flow cytometry studies. So the, there's a lot of things that you can do online. Um, one of which is uh, impo uh, excuse me, upload, save, and share cytometer configurations. Um, these can be BD instruments or they can be non-BD, uh, not a problem at all. And then using that cytometer information, you can create panels using either uh, BD reagents or non-BD reagents. So both are uh, available for you there. You can manage your antibody inventory and track titrations information and Later, I'll demonstrate how you can pull that titration information into your staining sheets. That is a new feature in 5.1. Um, we also have spectrum viewer capabilities and you can do additional workflows. So we have the, the panel creation workflow, um, which is already predetermined for you, but you can also create customized workflows for anything in the lab that you wanna keep track of. Um, so types of workflows might be a cytometer startup and shutdown that you can set up to be recurrent so that People can just log in. It keeps track of who did what in your lab. Um, or it could be also an experimental workflow, especially if there's handoffs uh, of different people handling different steps. You can create uh, an experimental workflow, and then it keeps track of who did what and when, and you can send notifications there as well. Um, in addition to that, you can create Facts Diva experiment uh, directly in BDRC that then you can import into Diva. So that saves time that you're not paying uh, the core lab for while you're setting up your experiment. And also um, it allows you easier uh, importing. So copy pasting of sample information. So whether it be keywords or just sample IDs, um, we have spreadsheet like capabilities that allows you to copy and paste large amounts of information so that it's embedded within your experiment. The advantage there is that it will then get written into your FCS file uh, as part of the data. So you never lose track of what that sample was or what was done to it. And then the uh, last item here is file storage. Within BDRC, you can upload data uh, directly to the cloud. So it's accessible to you from anywhere. And it has um, capabilities uh, with Flojo to connect to that data and download it locally so that you're not having to manually shuffle uh, files around. Because as we know, Flojo performance is best when your files are stored locally and not up uh, in, in some shared uh, server that you might be using at your institution. Um, okay, great. Uh, and, and anytime, if you have questions or you want more details, please feel free to interrupt. Um, I would like this to be as interactive as possible. As people are joining, I'm allowing um, users to, to unmute themselves. So yeah, feel free to, to jump in at any time. So what is new in 5.1? Uh, very briefly, we have a new homepage. We have reagent barcode scanning capabilities. So using your phone or tablet or uh, you know laptop, anything with a camera, you can scan BD reagents that have that 2D code on it. Um, this can be used to either track inventory. So as an order comes in, you can quickly scan them to add to your inventory. Um, once they're in your inventory, you can add titration information. And if you want to look up that titration information real quick, you just scan your vial and then you can see what titer to use at that. And as well for reordering, if you just ran out of a reagent um, and you want to remember to reorder it, then you can just scan it and add it quickly to, to your wish list. Um, so I'll be demonstrating that um, as well. Uh, we do have image panel design capabilities now for the Facts Discover S8. Uh, and then once you generate data with the S8, you are given two file formats, the FCS file and also a CVW file. So um, that CVW file, we have extraction capabilities to turn those into TIFF images in BDRC. Um, we have staining sheets that was not there in our previous version. So like I mentioned, you, and once you have that titration information in your inventory, you can pull that into your staining sheets and, and come up with a, a quick you know, calculation of how many samples to stain given your titration. 
Um, and then I also mentioned this before that you can uh, bulk rename specimen in your Faxtiva experiment, um, especially if you have complex names or anything that you could just copy paste with a spreadsheet like information. And um, also we have some automation uh, as part of BDRC that you can generate a titration image. So if you perform a titration, you select those you know five or 10 point dilutions of your antibody and we can concatenate them and uh, generate an image for you in BDRC. So if we start with the first point, a new home page. So I will navigate over here and go to bdresearchcloud.com and then log in with your Flojo portal ID. And this is what you see now um, for, for the home page. Um, we have navigation tabs up top and those navigation tabs also um, match the tiles up here. So I'll do a quick overview of general BDRC capabilities and then we'll jump into the new features. So here for panels, if you, you can click here or click here um, to access your panels. So what's in the panel section are uh, previous custom panels that you may have um, generated yourself or any lab mates. And we also have preloaded OMIPs that's available to all, as well as BD panels. And so these are useful um, to just look up information of what those panels are, what cytometer is created at, on um, visualization. So if you want to look at the spectral information of those panels in hindsight, and then we also have those staining sheets that I'll get into in just a second. Um, and if you want to uh, search for panels, so let's say you want to use an OMIP or, or you're curious to see if there's an OMIP that suits your need, you can just start typing in um, antigens here, uh, CD14, uh, CD19. And so as you see, I'm adding more and more reagents here, and then the list is filtering to only show me uh, which panels contain those specific markers. And then you can click on them and see if any of them suit your need. Um, so we show the panel as entered. We also have the citation link for, for OMIPS. Um, and you can look at those panels as is, or you can use it as a base to then modify it to see if it's compatible with your cytometer, or if you want to make a few simple swaps or deletions from these pre-built panels, you can do so. All right, so then um, I can either navigate back to the home page or go to another section directly here, but I'll just go back for uh, demonstration purposes to the home page. Um, so we went through the panels section in experiments. This is where you would create Faxdiva experiments. So these are past experiments I've already create, uh, created. I can edit, I can duplicate, or I can create from new. And then by creating a new experiment, it'll guide me through the process. I'll select the cytometer, the plate layout, identify cells, pull in panels, um, change voltages if I want to. Um, so those are all capabilities that exist within the experiment creation. But again, today I'm just going to focus on 5.1 um, details, but I'm happy to explore that later if there are questions. Workflows. So within workflows, uh, like I said, these are um, either the panel creation workflow that's already been created for you, or you can make customized workflow. So um, here we have a, an example of a Symphony startup. So this is really detailed and the advantage of custom workflows, you can make them as detailed uh, or, or not as, as desired. So these are really granular ones that keeps track of every single step, or you could just say step one, you know, clean instrument, step two, run QC. Um, so it's it's really up to you of the level of uh, detail you want to track in your lab. So that was an example of a cytometer startup, or you can also have a workflow um, experiment workflow where you have thaw cells, count the cells, you know, and you can have a protocol here. And then as users perform these steps, it keeps track of who did it. And there's a timestamp. And at the end, there's a report. And this is really nice if you build a, a workflow that then you have an acquisition step at the end, you can upload your files directly to the workflow and then everything stays together that you know exactly what the cells are, what they were treated with, what panel do you use, and then the, the data is there. So it's a nice organizational tool. But again, you don't have to use workflows. That's the, the nice part about BD Research Cloud. You can take it or leave it. You can still upload data outside of workflows if you are not interested in the workflow um, feature. Uh, all right, next is the data. So you can either upload data directly into workflows or you can just store it in your data uh, management tool here. So it's data up top. And um, here are the different project folders that get created. The, the structure within BDRC is that you create groups within your organization and the people in those groups 
have access to the data within those groups. So you can have multiple groups within the same organization and assign people to the different groups and those people will only have access to certain data. So we have that flexibility here if you want to control who has access to what as well. Uh, next is cytometers. <clears throat> so here is where you would upload and save cytometers. If you're a core lab manager, you would just upload your cytometers directly here. If you're a user of a core lab, you can connect to other people's cytometers. So here I have the little public icon. This is not my cytometer, but I connected to it. And when I mean connected, it just means that the configuration information is available to me to create panels and to create the Facts Diva experiment if it's a Diva uh, software running instrument. So this is, you know, an example of a public cytometer. These are cytometers I've uploaded myself and then other cytometers here as well. The way to add a cytometer is with the button up here. And there's three ways to upload your cytometers. If it's a Diva running instrument, you can just uh, upload the configuration file. That's our recommended uh, method in that way that the parameters are perfectly named and there's no mismatch. Um, but if it's not a uh, Diva running instrument, you can just create a custom one over here and you can use a BD one as a base. Or if it's not a BD instrument, you can just um, add one laser and detectors and manually enter your uh, information here. By clicking this publicly discoverable checkbox, this makes your um, cytometer available for others to view its configuration and make panels with. Um, so this is the middle tab up here, add a public cytometer. So if I wanted as a, a core lab user, I would search here for what is my core lab. I would click on it. I would see which cytometers are available from that core lab. I would click on it and just press the link cytometer. And then um, I would have that configuration available to me. Um, as a core lab manager, I can also send notifications about a cytometer. So if this is uh, one of mine, I would click on it. I could say take offline and then uh, it will notify. I can add a little message, oh, cytometer down for the day or maintenance or whatever. Um, and this will automatically uh, notify all the users that have this cytometer linked to them to let them know about the status. All right, so that's cytometers. Reagents. So this is the inventory section that I mentioned before. So there's multiple tabs here. Um, you have access to the BD catalog. You can search for any um, reagent here just to see if we offer it. Custom reagents. This is where you can manually add uh, non-BD reagents to use in panel design um, and or any custom, you know, if you have uh, in-house made tetramers or, or custom conjugates that aren't in the BD catalog, you add those here and then they become available to you during panel design. We have a spectrum viewer tab where you can have different types of views. So here, if I select on the S8, um, so you can have the combined view that here you can look one laser at a time, or you can have a stacked view where you look at one laser line at a time. Uh, or if it's a spectral instrument, you can toggle over to the spectral signature view or the spect uh, the heat map view, which is available for the BD instruments. The inventory feature is where you actually keep track of vials that are in your lab. So it will have uh, lot numbers. Uh, and if you've chosen to add titration information, you can click on it and titer and you would see the titration information that you've added. So this was a two microliter and 400 microliter total staining volume for a final dilution of one in 200. Um, you can add multiple titers for uh, a reagent if you have different conditions um, that you use them under that require different titers, or you can just have the one. So if you have multiple, you would just select which one you want to show on the main card, or if you um, just have the one, this one is shown by, by default. And I'll show you later that this titration information gets pulled into the staining sheet feature that I'll show in just a second. Uh, here we have populations. This is where you can define your own population antigen density. BDRC comes with literature defined populations with along with citations just to show, you know, basic 
markers that define certain cell populations to help out new users. And then it, we also have the link of where we got those definitions, but uh, users can add their own custom populations. We realize the antigen density uh, can change drastically based on your cell type, your conditions, uh, the isolation type that you chose. Um, so the source of those cells can really affect antigen density. So based on your specific conditions uh, in, that, that are being used in your lab, you can upload the antigen density information and specific markers that you tend to use to identify cell types. And this is useful during panel creation, that if you're always using the same markers that have the same antigen density while creating your panels, you can just import them all at once. So you don't have to always add them one by one. So that's the population. So to create one, you would just hit this create button and add the markers one at a time. And lastly, uh, the two last tabs, groups and projects and users. So groups and projects, this is how you organize who has access to what data. So you would create different groups and invite different users to those groups. And within the groups, you can have additional subfolders that represent project to better organize your data. So here we have users that are in this group and I can also um, assign different group level permissions, or if I go to the users tab, then I can see the details and permissions that they have on the um, organization level. Are they allowed to modify cytometers? Yes or no. Can they view data outside of their own group, like an admin level type of deal, uh, you know, manage staining sheets so you can dictate what um, users can and cannot do as the administrator of your organization. Um, when you first sign up to BDRC, you're given an individual organization. So here I would have Emily's individual organization. This is meant for solo work, uh, things that I just want to you know, keep for myself that I don't necessarily want to share or, or show other people. But if you're in a lab and you want to have that collaborative um, workspace where you're, you're putting everybody's data in a shared location, then I would say the next step to the individual org. So just to demonstrate, if you go to the users section, it shows this is your individual org. You can't add additional users to this org, um, but you can create a collaborative org. So to do that, I click my name up here go to create an organization. And then here are the different license types within BDRC. So you're given your individual one when you first create your account, and then you can create an essentials one. So this is a free org, um, create a free org. Uh, you would give it a name. So probably the name of your core lab or the name of your PI that you work in or your name if you're the PI. Um, and then this allows you to invite up to nine other people. So 10 total users, you get additional data storage per user um, as well. And you're, you're given access to a few more uh, features that are not available in the individual org. There are some uh, features that are only available to our professional and premium, which are paid license types. Um, so these you would click for a quote, depending on the number of seats that you're looking for. Uh, of note, we our uh, tighter management and inventory features are premium features at the moment. Um, but we hope to to offer you know free trials if you're interested in testing it out to see if this is of interest for you or if this is you know useful. Um, please reach out. We're happy to give you a temporary trial for these um, upgraded license types. Any questions so far? I realize I'm going kind of quick, but I want to get into those five one features. So far, so good. All right. All right, so now that you kind of have, whoops, I'm gonna change my org back to the collaborative one. My lab, okay. So now that you've kind of seen the uh, overview, we're gonna jump into the new features. So we went through the new homepage. Uh, let's look at reagent barcode scanning. So that is in the reagent section. So if I go to reagents here or reagents here, we have scanned reagents that is a feature, a new feature that wasn't there in previous version. So if you click here and uh, click scan a reagent, it will ask for access uh, for your camera. And so I took some shots from my phone. Uh, so this is available. If you just log into BDRC through your phone, through your regular browser, um, this is what you'll see. Um, so BD Research Cloud, it'll say select a camera. Um, so once I've selected a camera and press data matrix, it'll open up a little camera that you then can zoom on. So, so there are zoom buttons as well. And depending on your phone, it might look slightly different. You know, if you have an iPhone or an Android, what version you're running and all that. Um, but in a nutshell, it looks somewhat like this. 
and you'll be able to scan those 2D barcodes on BD uh, reagents. Once it picks up the barcode, it shows up here as a scanned reagent, and it will also show up uh, on the full version, which is uh, the, the desktop, or not the desktop, but the, the non-mobile version uh, of BDRC, and it'll also show up here in the scan reagent. So you see this list here matches what was shown on my phone. So when you scan a reagent, it'll just give you a snapshot with a little bit of details here. And if you click on a scanned reagent, then it'll give you additional details of that uh, particular reagent. And if you've already added it to your inventory, so the first time here that I've scanned it, if it's not in my inventory, it's gonna let me know it's not in my inventory. And I have the choice to add it to my inventory or add it to my wish list if I want to you know, purchase another one or if I just want to look up information about this vial. So if it's already in my inventory and I've added titration information, but I don't remember what it is, um, here is that screenshot that it shows for that reagent that I just scanned and clicked on. It shows me the dilution information. Uh, so once I've found the information I need, I can just delete the scan or I can leave the scan to do additional features, uh, functions with that scan. Uh, so that was the reagent barcoding. So you can um, yeah, add it to inventory or add it to wish list. So you can do that either through your, your mobile device or if you're back on the full version, um, then here are the buttons, add to inventory, add to wish list, or delete the scan. Um, if I say add to wish list, it, it then appears uh, on this page. And so uh, every user has a default wish list that then it gets added to. If I want to create different wish lists, so based on maybe different projects have different uh, budgets that I want to order from, I can create additional lists and order a subset of the default and move those reagents around to different uh, wish lists if needed. All right, I'm just unmuting some people. Great. So that was. Um, the wish list, cart shopping, titration lookup I went through. Okay, let's jump into imaging panel design for the S8. So to do so, I can um, access the way I like to do it. I like to go panels and create panels. So let's go do that. I give it my panel a name and assign it a project. So you always assign a things you create within BDRC to a project for organization and um, also permissions. Uh, reasons to, so different people have different access to it. Um, I can either start uh, a panel from scratch or I can start one from a previous one. So here, if I click, I will see all the custom panels that are in my organization or I can select OMIPS to use as a base or I can select BD panels. But if I don't make any selections here, I can just press start and, and create one from scratch. So let's do that. All right, so we are here, select a cytometer. So I'm going to select the S8 for imaging purposes. Um, and I can also double check here the configuration of the cytometer I've selected. Um, so it shows the UV, violet, blue laser, and then the additional imaging blue that has uh, up to three colors here. So if I click complete step. So step one is cytometer selection. Step two is um, selecting your targets. So here I can select my uh, species and I can either add antigens one at a time, right? Like we're used to doing CD3, enter, all that. Or if you've already created a population in the population section, I can pull in all that information along with the antigen density all with one click, right? Um, so I'm gonna add a few more antigens just for fun. CD19, 20, if you've created any custom um, reagents or antigens, they will show up here as well. And I'm gonna include a viability die. So what is um, new with the S8 is that you have this extra column that um, is not there for, if you've selected a non-imaging cytometer, you won't see this, but if you've selected the S8, you have this imaging column that you can select. Um, so for this panel, I'm going to choose to visualize through imaging up to three markers. I'm going to select those three. And then we also have our existing one, the exclusion one. So this is a dump channel. If you want to put more than one marker in the same color because you're negatively selecting for them, you have the option to do so. So I'm going to dump out my B cell markers just for demonstration purposes. And I'm going to keep this panel small just to keep things moving along. Um, if you wanted, you can restrict 
which type of reagents are available to you. If you have specific clone preferences, you can restrict those at this point, or you just leave it default to see all the fluorochrome colors um, that are available for all the clones. Again, feel free to interrupt at any time if I'm going too fast or if you have questions. So here we are at step three. This is where we manually assign fluorochromes to the markers we've assigned in uh, step three. So what's new with the S8 is that um, you have markers here that have been separated out uh, because they, uh, they've been tagged as imaging markers, right? So these are the ones that I selected with that column. And then below are the non-imaging markers and then the exclusion ones that are in the dump channel. So if I select my, the first marker, I see what colors um, that marker is available in. This list gets populated by the two tabs in the reagent section. It gets populated by the what's in the BD catalog and also what you've entered in your custom reagent. So this could be um, you know non-BD fluorochromes that you wish to include in your panels. Um, so for fun, if I start clicking here on the fluorochromes, you can see that um, the spectrum viewer on the right starts to get populated. Because these have been marked as imaging marker, these are fluorochromes that will get excited only by the blue laser. And um, I can switch views um, back to the combined one. So this shows me the imaging filters and see uh, and shows me how well of a fit these fluorochromes you know, work given the, the configuration and, and their excitation level by the blue laser. So visually, you can select which ones you want um, <clears throat> using the different views. So this was the combined view where we're selecting the imaging blue laser. If you toggle this, this will show the spectral blue laser filters. You can also use the stack view if you want to see all lasers at once. The imaging blue is at the bottom. You can have the spectral signature or the heat map uh, as well. So I'll show you um, how to toggle back and forth once we have a bit more um, floor chrome. So um, let's just kind of, all right, let's go with Fitzy. Once I, I have a mark, uh, floor chrome that I like for a marker, I just pair it. And then this will become static. So as I add to it, I'll see the interaction between the fluorochromes for the panels. You'll also notice that some warnings now have popped up because of interactions of fluorochromes with previously paired uh, fluorochromes. So here, if I hover over MCIN, it's saying, oh, it's using the same peak filter as something I've already paired for imaging. So it's letting me know, oh, this might not be a great choice. Uh, same here, it's showing me Fitzy's already paired. And these are toggles that you can use up here to hide the warning. So it will remove any fluorochromes that has those warnings so that you're just left with a cleaner um, list. But for now, I'll just leave it for demonstration purposes. You can also filter these uh, fluorochromes in different ways. You can filter them by fluorochrome name. You can search for specific fluorochromes here if you don't want to scroll up and down looking for something, if you know you, you want a specific color. Um, so you can sort by fluorochrome name, brightness, resolution, laser, and you can also use the toggle to up and down the, the sort order. Um, so for CD8 here, let's go with, sure, some PE. And then Fox P3, you know, something down over here. Sure. Let's select that. So now that I've selected the three imaging um parameters, I'm moving on to the non-imaging uh, marker. So if I click on CD3, let's see if I get a warning. So yeah, <clears throat> these ones are showing me warnings down here. And if I hover, it's saying BB515, BB515 will be detected in one or more imaging channels and may negatively affect the quality. So if I click on here, right, it's overlapping with the Fitzy. So that's not a great choice. And it's, so it's showing me, um, same with the Nova Floor. Uh, that it's going to end up being in my imaging channel um, filter. So it, it's going to affect the imaging quality. So don't select those. So those are what those warnings are. Um, but if I stay with the ones that don't have warnings, then I can select something that I like. So let's go to spectral signature view here. As I click through, let's pick something UV related. So a spark UV this is a non-BD fluorochrome, so I've already created the CD3 Spark UV in the uh, custom reagent, so that's why it's showing as available here, even though it's not a, a BD reagent. But let's continue here. Um, 
let's select a violet, try to space things out. Sure. And, you know, of course, I'm going quite quickly here. So that we won't end up with the most optimal panel, but it will work. Hmm. Let's go maybe here. Sure. And then the exclusion marker, right? So we want two markers in the same floor chrome. It shows me what they're both available in. Okay, why not? So I've tried to space things out a little bit uh, based on lasers. I can uh, look at one laser at a time. So in this view, the combined view, it shows me, so you select which laser line you're, you're interested in. So the laser line will show you the primary uh, floor chromes in, in a filled curve, and then the hashed curves are showing spillover coming from other lasers, uh, other floor chromes that get excited by other lasers. So it gives you an indication of what might spill over where and cause spreading or loss of resolution. So here, this PE, even though it's going to be blue for imaging, it's going to be primary yellow green for a spectral. So you can look at it that way. Um, or again, in the stacked view to see everything all at once is an option. Um, <clears throat> if you want to hide individual floor chromes, even though that they're, uh, they were paired, you can do so. Um, one tool that I like to use is if I scroll down to the population, I can press here the view population. And what this will do is remove anything that's negative for this population. So what I'm left with are only markers that will be co-expressed for the population of interest. And in step two, the previous step, I only put a single um, population, but you have the option to put more than one. So you can have Tregs, monocyte, dendritic cells, depending on your panel, especially if it's a particularly large one that you're looking at multiple cell subsets that have different expression of these markers. You can look at them one at a time and assess visually what kind of issues you might encounter with co-expression, if any. Um, oh, I kind of glossed over the similarity matrix. Um, so as you're uh, going through here, let's unpair this guy. So as you're making selections here, this gets updated. Um, sorry. So yeah, as you're, you're clicking through the different floor chromes, it'll update the similarity matrix and give you an idea of similarity in matrix um, information as well as the complexity score. Um, so we have uh, spectral information for most fluorochromes, most commonly used ones. There are a few that we may not have, and those get highlighted. I don't see any right now. But um, if your uh, similarity matrix shows up with NA, it just means that we don't have spectral signature information for that particular fluorochrome. And in that case, the complexity score cannot be calculated. So you might see that error. You can still build a panel around it. You just won't get that um, additional information with that particular floor. Any questions so far? OK, so I'll just pair this with a random fluorochrome. And now we can move on to the next step. <clears throat> So now that I've paired all the markers with the floor chromes, and I'm happy with the panel, it shows me what uh, reagent options are available to me. So for CD3, BUV395, there are different test size. And if there are more than one clones, um, those are shown to me here. Uh, I can you know, click on the image to make it bigger if I want to uh, look at the details, or I can click on learn more. And this will bring me to the BD website and show me details about that particular floor chrome. Um, so you can, yeah, change your selections if you have a test size or a uh, clone preference at that point. Um, list price is also shown and also list price for the individual markers are shown. Uh, if I'm happy with those decisions, I click complete. And now this is um, finalizing the shopping list. So if I want to purchase all of them, I just continue. If I have some of these, I can uh, delete them, the ones I don't need to purchase and only keep the ones I do need to purchase. Uh, if you have access to the inventory feature, it will let you know with a little check mark which ones you already have in your lab that you don't need to purchase. Um, and you can also remove them all with one click. Remove everything that's already in my inventory and just purchase what's left. Um, again, list price. And now I'm going to finalize the workflow. So this is the last step. 
where um, I have a, a finalized panel, I have a finalized shopping list, I can either go straight to BD Cart. If, you, if your institution allows for that, you can purchase them directly here. Um, so the reagent list gets transferred over. If I sign in, then I'll get updated pricing based on my uh, you know, login information and institutional discounts. Um, so that was a BD car. I can also create a shopping list, which is compatible with punch out. Um, so I won't go through that whole process, but you just log in and it creates a shopping list items. Uh, and then you can also download, right? So either download the panel summary or just the shopping list. You can email it. If you're not the one purchasing yourself and you have to email it to your admin to place the order, you can email the shopping list. Uh, you can request a quote to get in touch with your reagent. Uh, rep. So just by pressing the button uh, based on your location in BDRC, I'll just automatically uh, send an email and uh, also the reagent list that you're interested in getting a quote for. And then lastly, I can view panel details. So now that I'm done, I want to see my finalized panel. And here it is. It'll show up back in the panel section under custom panel. And it'll show the details of the panel I just created. Um, I see the details of the panel, the cytometer details that it was built on, the visualizations tool that you can look back and um, assess the, the spectral characteristics of the panel you built, and then also the staining sheet. So um, right now I only had one of the um, reagents that was in my inventory. So it looked it up, it saw what lot was available to me. Uh, lot one, two, three, four, five, and what I had titered it at. So when I go to create the staining sheet, it automatically pulls this information. So this panel has reagents that I have not entered um, titration inf information for, so I can just manually add them if I wanted to. Um, but alternatively, I'll toggle over to a panel that I've already set up, that I've already performed titration information on, and I've uh, entered that information in the inventory and so now when I toggle to the staining sheet, it already shows me what lots available to me and what titration I've um, entered for this. You can always overwrite um, the titration if for whatever reason you don't want to use that one. You can just manually update it with um, a different titer. So you're not stuck to this if you don't want to use it. If you have more than one lot, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, so here we go. So if you have more than one lot in your inventory, you can select the lot that's in front of you that you look to use. And if it has a different titer, it will update it. Um, expiration date, if you've entered that in the in, uh, inventory, it'll also show you that information. So let's go ahead and create a staining sheet. So this first step is you have to enter all the tighter uh, information. So I'm gonna hit save to save that information. Then I will create uh, of my first staining step. So by clicking add, I'm on staining step one. I can rename this. I'm gonna call it my viability stain. Um, and I'm going to take my viability die and drag it over because that's what I want to stain for today. Uh, my staining volume is default 100, but I can change that number of samples, let's say five. And as I change these numbers, uh, the, the calculations get updated. And the stain buffer, if I want to specify what I'm actually going to dilute the viability stain in, I can do that. So for viability, I don't want any, whoops, protein in there. So I'm going to change this to PBS and hit Great. So now I have staining step one that has been created. I want to then add another one. Uh, so staining step two, I'm going to say is my surface stain. Um, and my staining buffer, I'm going to say it's wash buffer. And I'm going to pull in my surface stain. So CD3, 4, 8, 19, 20, 25, and 127. Uh, again, I'm going to do five for whatever reason, just for kicks, I'm gonna change this to 50. So you can see everything gets updated. Um, and if I wanted to add a, a brilliant stain buffer at this step, it shows um, you know, the our catalog numbers and the recommended uh, volumes here. So I'm gonna use this one, just drag it over. Um, everything gets updated. So brilliant stain buffers uh, work differently that it's, it's a microliter per stain, right? Um, so that uh, the calculations get performed accordingly, uh, and I'm gonna hit create. Uh, I forgot to mention that if, before starting uh, this process, if you had any additional reagents that you wanted to add aside from uh, staining buffers like uh, FC block or, or monocyte block or anything like that, you can also add it here and it'll get added to your panel and become an option during your staining steps.
Um, so last step here, fantastic, is going to be my internuclear. All right. Uh, and then I'm going to drag in the Fox B3. Do I want a brilliant stain? Why not? I'm going to throw that in there. Uh, and then this will be washed. Oh, no, this won't be washed. It, this will be the, uh, what's it called? Uh, I'll just say buffer. So with Fox P3, depending on the transcriptional factor you use, you might um, need to stain in that buffer for best results. So I can make a note of that there, right here. And um, there you go. Uh, I don't know if you noticed that as I'm creating the, the staining steps, uh, floor chromes that were used in previous steps become grayed out so that you don't double stain them or get confused. Uh, and then this one, I forgot to update the number of samples. So I'll go back here, edit, press five, update. There you go. And so once you're done, you can um, download the PDF or the CSV of your staining sheet. And then you have a nice little summary and the math behind what you need to stain for that day. So um, we hope to that this speeds up your staining steps. You can also update this. So you only have one staining sheet available at a time. Uh, so if you come tomorrow and you want to change those um, numbers, you just update it. Uh, we're assuming that the PDF is the source of truth of, you know, what you stained for that one day. And then if you change it, then, you know, that's your new record of the day of what you did. Um, any questions about the staining sheets? All right. So let's see. We went through the home page, barcoding, image pal design, staining sheets. So I didn't go through here. Bulk rename. Okay. So uh, CVW file extraction is just a button that once you upload a CVW file, well, actually, as you upload it to BDRC, and I'll show you how to do that. Um, so that would be in the data. In the data section, you just go to your project file where you want to upload it. And then I would select upload to project, click that, and then you can either drag single files and then it'll stay in the root file project. Or if I want to drag in a folder, it'll create a, a folder with those uh, elements within it. So I would just drag it in here and then it gets uploaded. And um, if it sees that you're uploading CVW, it'll ask you right away, um, do you want to extract once we're done uploading? So you can just click yes. And that um, will happen in the background or if you haven't extracted it yet, um, it's a button here that you press and then that gets turned into the TIFF images that get stored in the S3 uh, bucket. So um, once the extraction is complete, you'll just have a message here saying extraction complete. Um, those files will not become visible to you in this structure because or else you'd get cluttered with tens of thousands of individual cell images, right? So it'll just let you know images are extracted. They're there in the background if you want to use them with Flojo and CellView Lens. Any questions about that? All right. Um, staining sheet. So let's do the titration and then I'll finish off with the um, Diva. Uh, titration image. So again, in data, if I go to titrations, uh, project files, and then I'll go to my HLADR titration. So here I have a series of dilution, right? That I titrated HLADR APCH7. So I can select one, two, three, four, five, and go to the batch action button and say generate titration image. And so it'll ask me, where do you want to save it? I want to save it in the project in my titration group or project in my HLADR titration subfolder. What do I want to name it? I want to name it, you know, today's 2023, December 13, titration image. And what do I want to call this? Um, at, within the image, uh, do I want to give it a title? So I'm going to say HLADR, APC, H7, you know, lot, one, two, three, four, five. Um, and then here it shows the files I've selected. And if I want to rename these, uh, so the default name will just be the file name. But if I want to rename them, I can say, you know, five microliter, or let's start with 10. So 10 microliter, five microliter, 2.5, 1.25, and 0.6. 
and then I'm going to press confirm. So image generation in progress. Um, it takes a minute the first time because uh, the microservice has to boot up from cold. So we're just going to wait a few seconds for that titration image to uh, generate itself. I'll get another flash message once it's complete. There we go. Uh, so I here I can click view image. It'll bring me directly to that image. There it is. It shows me, you know, 10 microliter, 5, 2.5. So it's a nice, easy concatenation that you don't have to do it yourself manually. So that's an example of a microservice that we've uh, performed in BDRC. We hope to move more and more towards these automated type of uh, features that uh, by uploading your data to the cloud, we have access to that data and we can do things to it, right? Um, and again, um, the BDRC is in active development. We're, we're constantly adding more features. If there's something specific that you would like to see in BDRC that adds value to you or, or saves time for you, please don't hesitate to reach out to me and share um, you know, your desires and we can see what we can do. Um, the objective here with BDRC is to make your life easier um, and streamline uh, analysis and other anything related to flow, right? Uh, so last thing we didn't cover was bulk rename specimens if you're creating a fax diva experiment. So if I go to experiments, I'll just, well, okay. I'll, <laughs> for for time, I'll, I'll jump into one I've already created, but if you want me to go through the whole process, um, I'm happy to do so. So here, um, if you have a plate loader capability, you can uh, generate your samples here. Um, and it gives them a default name of specimen, you know, one, two, three, four, five. So if you want to just leave that default name for now, I'll show you how to bulk rename them. You can rename them here individually, but if you had, you know, a full plate, this would take time to rename one by one. If we go to keywords, then uh, I'll show you how to uh, copy paste. Um, if you don't have a plate loader, you would just go straight to this where you would add, you know, specimens and samples as you would in Diva. Um, <clears throat> Then uh, if you're starting from blank, you select all your tubes and then uh, you can then pull in panel information from any panel that's uh, that you've created in BDRC. So if this was a new experiment, I'd have samples here that don't have any labels in the um, in the parameters. I would just look up what panel I've created and these would get auto filled for me um, so that there's no typos, no spending time renaming all of these. Um, it's just pulled in and everything works. Uh, and then here in keywords, this is where you have the chance to add additional keywords. Um, and those keywords can be, you know, stimulation conditions. These could be um, information about the samples themselves. You know, if these are, are subjects, um, which cohort they fall into, the age, you know, any kind of parameter that you know you'll want to sort with or use uh, for download graphing purposes, entering them within the FCS and having Flojo being able to sort using those uh, keywords, it makes your life a lot easier. So we've made um, adding keywords and, and populating those keyword values easier through BDRC. Um, so if I just say, um, create a new spreadsheet for demonstration purposes. So if I go, how many samples do I have here? 10, A, H, I, whoops, J. Okay, so then, so assuming these are long, very complicated names, I don't want to rename manually. I could just copy here, come to the specimen and paste it, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you know. And so, and same with the keywords here, if I had this long, one, two, three, I could, you know, copy paste. Can I do two keywords at a time? I'm not sure. Yes, I can. Here we go. Um, so yeah, you could just copy paste large information, uh, you know, large amounts of, of information all at once and it'll paste into your keywords. Um, so the, the specimen bulk rename is a new feature of this recent release. Um, so in a nutshell, those are the uh, upgrades that we've done for 5.1. I'm happy to go into these in more detail or to go through any other existing BDRC functionality, if you want to learn more about it, I'm happy to spend time on that. Any questions?
So I don't see anything in the chat or in the Q&A or unmuting. Um, I'm going to stick around for a couple more minutes um, if anyone wants to discuss anything privately. But if not, thank you very much for for joining today. And I hope you give uh, BD Research Cloud a shot and let us know what, what you think. <laughs>